This video covers the first lesson in statistics from the viewpoint of a chemist. As chemists, we deal with data every day. We make measurements on chemical systems and interpret them to make inferences about what is going on chemically. In fact, the beginning of the science of modern chemistry is often said to coincide with the use of quantitative measurements by the French scientist Antoine Lavoisier who worked during the period of the 1760s through 1794. In order to make valid inferences about numerical data, we need to understand how reliable our measurements are. No doubt you already know about random processes that can lead to errors in our measurements. So here we are going to discuss how these errors lead to a distribution of the data and how that impinges on the conclusions that we can draw from our data. Consider for a moment the measurement of glucose in blood. One's blood sugar level is very important to a person who has diabetes. So diabetic individuals usually have their own devices for monitoring it. Here is an electrochemical device that measures glucose directly from a drop of blood. This device uses disposable test strips that are inserted into the meter. The user applies a sterile lance to draw some blood. The tip of the test strip draws up some sample by capillary action. Suppose you apply this device to a drop of your blood and find that it's a bit on the high side, say 215 milligrams of glucose per deciliter of blood. Is some course of action appropriate? Before doing anything drastic, you might be interested in knowing how good a number that is. That is, how close can you expect that value to be to the true concentration of glucose in your blood? Maybe you should take another measurement and see what the reproducibility is. So you do so. Ah, this is a little bit lower. But which one do you trust now? Both measurements were performed according to the prescribed procedure. How about another? Perhaps the average is a good number. In general, we would expect that the more measurements that we average, the more reliably the average represents the true value. Let's collect some more values. In fact, if we take many more measurements, say 100, we might see them pile up in a classical bell-shaped curve. Now we have a bit more information about our measurement. We can calculate an average and if only random errors are operating, then we can expect that the average will be a good estimate of the true value. Furthermore, we see that the curve is symmetric about the average, and the width of the curve indicates how reproducible the measurements are. We should keep in mind that the variability in our numbers can be due to some random changes in the measurement process, such as noise in the device, but it also is possible that there are real fluctuations in the glucose level from sample to sample, perhaps from moment to moment. The more reproducible the data, the skinnier the curve. The wider the curve, the less certainty that we have in a given measurement of its being close to the true value. The good news is that random processes follow the mathematics of probability theory as described in the 19th century by the prince of mathematicians, Carl Friedrich Gauss. We can make some generalizations about the distribution of our data, assuming that it follows a normal curve or Gaussian distribution. In general, we graph our measurements with the measured value on the horizontal axis and the frequency that a given value is observed on the vertical axis. If we record a very large number of measurements, perhaps hundreds, then the data will be symmetrically distributed about the average. For such a large data set, we call the average the population average and represent it with the Greek letter mu. We will convey to others the width of our distribution curve by stating the distance between the average value and the measured value at the inflection point on the curve. This distance is called the standard deviation for the data set. Note that it has the same units as the measured value. We use the Greek letter sigma to represent the standard deviation of a very large population. So for a quick review, mu equals the population average, the average of a very large number of measurements, and sigma equals the population standard deviation. 
else showed that the population standard deviation can be calculated from this equation, where n is the number of measurements or data points in the set. Now, in chemical analysis settings, we rarely have the luxury of taking hundreds of measurements to determine a single system. It is usually not a practical use of time and resources. Think about that for a second. Would you want to prick your finger 200 times to determine your current glucose level? So usually we're dealing with a much smaller data set. We can calculate an average and a standard deviation for a small set. Turns out that the following equation yields a much better estimate of the larger population standard deviation. We use an S to represent the sample standard deviation and X bar is the average for the sample set. Before closing this lesson, let's look at some other useful terms that we should be familiar with. The square of the standard deviation shows up in lots of equations. It is often called the variance for the data set. We also note that the standard deviation is often what people are referring to when they talk about the random error or uncertainty in the data. Finally, it is also useful to think about how big the error is with respect to the measured quantity. So we define the relative error as the ratio of the standard deviation to the average.